Hi, it's a quick revision of uh, setting and of mice and men. And we're going to start with uh, the first major setting, the brush or the water hole. Now, the description of this goes over chapters 1 and 6. We'll start with chapter 1, but it is that uh, way in which chapter 6 parallels chapter 1 that's really important in terms of this setting. So, first of all, key words. So, the Salinas River drops in close to the hillside bank and runs deep and green. The water is warm too, for it slips twinkling over the yellow sands in the sunlight before reaching the narrow pool. Um, colour is really important for Steinbeck. And first of all, the colour green here might suggest verdancy, new life. It's a very positive term to use in terms of the description of the uh, river. Slip suggests an ease of movement. And twinkling has very positive connotations. It's almost uh, childlike and it's uh, often associated with things that we have positive connotations for, like uh, stars, etc. The key thing here is that he's creating almost a pastoral idyll. This is a place that's truly beautiful in its description, and it's the place where everything is really free. Um, it's the one place really where George and Lenny are free before they're confined by their entry to the bunkhouse. If we go on, the water is warm too, for it's slipped twinkling over the yellow sands, and on one side of the golden foothill slopes. Uh, again, in terms of colour motifs, yellow is really important. Golden, of course, has connotations of value, but yellow itself is a very positive colour, reinforcing this uh, description that seems to be an idyll of the pastoral. On the sandy bank under the trees, the leaves lie deep and so crisp that a lizard makes a great skittering if he runs among them. He's not running among them, it's if he does. So the use of that conditional is talking about animals who are present, but there is no activity. And that continues all the way through. When the rabbits are described, they sit on the sand. They're passive. They're there, but they're not doing anything. And there are lots of um, descriptions of tracks in the sand as well, of animals that are there at different times of day that aren't present now. It moves on. Evening of a hot day started the little winds to moving among the leaves. The shade climbed up the hills toward the top. On the sandbanks, the rabbits sat as quietly as little grey sculptured stones. Um, the rabbits uh, conveyed through this simile of little grey sculptured stones, again reinforcing their inactivity. They don't move. They're present, but um, they're essentially lifeless. Not in a negative way at this point. You know, it's almost uh, as if they're art, but they certainly don't move. And the other quietly just reinforces their um, kind of lack of presence. Now, if we move into chapter six, we see that um, what we have here is narrative symmetry. Uh, the description of the setting from chapter 1 is continued in chapter 6, so we get this sense in which there were parallels being drawn, just that there were parallels between things like uh, Candy's dog and Lenny. We get this sense of circularity, as if what's happened once will happen again. There's a real sense of fate, and that's conveyed through this setting. It's again the deep green pool, reminding us of the chapter 1 description. It's still in the late afternoon, same time of day, and there's still that passivity. It's still... The sun had left the valley, and we're starting to get a few negative descriptions coming in at this point. Um, even though there's pleasant shade, and the sun is described as rosy on the mountains, which is essentially a positive word, even the word rosy has connotations that could be linked to blood. And given that we know that uh, Curly's wife has been killed, and that uh, Lenny is about to meet his fate as well, it's an appropriate term to have a slightly negative connotation for. But it's when we get to the description of the animals now, which have ceased being passive and are very much active, that we really get the sense of change. A water snake glided smoothly up the pool, twisting its periscope head from side to side. Now, obviously in terms of the image, you've got the sense of the snake's head sticking out of the water in the same way that a, a submarine's periscope sticks out of the water. But the crucial thing here is that the semantic field of weaponry is being used. It's the same with the heron. In terms of the verb, a silent head and beak lanced down. This head and beak is compared to the lance of um, a knight. Again, a, a weapon used to kill. So that semantic field of weaponry, of death, is being applied to the animals. And when we think that things like uh, Lenny is constantly compared to an animal, we can see the link between animals and death is going to have application to Lenny and the other characters as well. What we get here is a sense of survival of the fittest. That one animal that might be regarded as quite threatening is being consumed, killed, 
by something greater than itself. I would argue that we're almost dealing with the greater thing being American society that's consuming, that's killing the weaker individuals within it. In this case, Lenin. It may be interesting that um, it's a little snake. And when we remember that uh, Lenin's surname is small, could the comparison between the snake and Lenny be relatively clear? We have again the wind, but this time, rather than it being that little wind, it's a far rush of wind sounded, and a gust drove through the tops of the trees. There's a real sense of, of power here and tension and a, a change being created. But then everything settles back to the way it was. You get that pattern returning, that narrative symmetry being developed. As quickly as it had come, the wind died and the clearing was quiet again. The heron stood in the shallows, motionless and waiting. Again, that cycle is being restarted. Another little water snake swam up the pool, turning its periscope head from side to side. It's only really the entrance of Lenny that stops it being killed. Once again, the connection between Lenny and the snake's fate is being established by Steinbeck. And finally, the light climbed on out of the valley, and as it went, the tops of the mountains seemed to blaze with increasing brightness. There seems to be in the blaze this idea of something quite powerful, emotionally turbulent, being foregrounded. And then we're going to get the incident with Lenny and George.